Alrighty, pop quiz. If a DC Metro train leaves Prince George's County traveling 33 miles per hour carrying a black woman who is hemorrhaging from fibroids, will she make it to Capitol Hill before she soils her clothes? The answer, unfortunately for me, is no, I wasn't making it. I'm Nikki Mayo and this is my fibroid story. All right, let's start off with the obvious. Fibroids freaking suck. Fibroids are tumors. They grow on the wall of the uterus. They are typically benign, which means they are non-cancerous, but the impact they can have on a woman's life can be absolutely excruciating. I started noticing that I was having difficulties with um, fibroids around 2017 and you know, it was already a very craptastic year of my life, and this added a lot of insult to injury. I was getting the cramping, I was having the elongated menstrual cycle periods, and um, I was hurting a lot and doing it all in silence, trying to hide it. But I have to say that I knew something was definitely not right. I was trying my best to hide things because I didn't want anyone to look down on me and I thought that I was broken or something was wrong with me. Um, as much as I love newspapers, I was carrying a newspaper around and I would just sit on it whenever I had to go into someone else's office because they want to talk for ad nauseum for whatever reason. And all I could think about while they were speaking was, Lord, please don't let me bleed out on this person's chair or please don't let me have an accident right now. It was anxiety mixed with, I'm already in physical pain. So it's just a all around painful thing. And think about that. I was showing up at like 100% daily and taking all the things that the world was throwing at me. And I had all this happening on the inside of me at the same time. So I will say that dealing with fibroids made me make some career decisions. From that job that did not have any insurance, it made me decide that I definitely needed to pivot professionally in my journalism career and go somewhere where I would have stable hours, but more importantly, stable benefits, because I wasn't sure what was happening with my body at that time in 2017, but I definitely knew that I needed some stable insurance to see this all the way through to the end, figure out what's gonna happen and if there's surgery possibly in my future. I just did not know that what I was dealing with at that time were fibroids. Coincidentally, it was through my career that I was introduced to the White Dress Project. Uh, they are an advocacy group for women, fighting fibroids and um, they do a lot more. I'm gonna put a link down in the description to give you more information about them. But uh, through their programming, I was exposed to countless doctors as they talked about research. Um, there are different types of treatment options and the fact that there's implicit bias sometimes on the surgery table. Like I was learning so much about this thing that was um, really ailing my body and I just felt so empowered that I can make an educated decision. So initially I started uh, two years back with birth control pills. That was great for the symptoms. It reduced the number of the days that I was having a period and the biggest um, hurdle that I was having was the side effect from the birth control pills, which are um, everything from you can have dryness during sex, you can have uh, weight gain, um, I obviously want to have a child and if you're on birth control pills, you can't have a child. You see how that works? So I was really like, I'm happy to have the pain go away, at least temporarily for a while. But I am kind of concerned about like, how long can I last on this? And then if I went into any time I missed a day or two or whatever, the period would be back like a vengeance and the pain would be back just as horribly. So I was not enjoying being on these, but same token, it's like that was an answer, a Band-Aid answer. It was about a year ago that I finally said, okay, I need to start looking for like real treatment options, meaning I want these out of me. There were three major factors that I took into account. For me, there's a lot of factors people have, I know, but for me, there were three major factors that went into deciding what type of treatment option that I would have. The first was 
trusting my doctor. The second was my personal safety on the surgical table. And the final one is the implicit bias in medicine and the impact on me as a black woman. So the first one was trusting my doctor. The doctor that did my open myomectomy, she is the bomb.com, I love her to death. And she is actually my third doctor that I looked into when deciding, okay, I eventually need to get this taken care of. I need someone who cares. The first doctor, I saw her once and then um, didn't see her again. I had access to the, the t nurse practitioners and I had an emergency and I remember being blown off for about a week and a half. So I'm sitting here trying to find ways to quell the pain. And the nurse practitioner that I needed to speak to was not available and no one at the office could either get the doctor or talk to me. That level of dismissal was enough for me to say, I don't wanna do this anymore with you all. I need a new doctor. The second one came very highly recommended and is the bee's knees, I'm sure, but it just kind of felt a little too busy in that office. And I also got hit with the line of, well, let's wait until they get bigger, meaning wait until your fibroids get a bigger size and then we'll do something about it. So the whole wait and see thing didn't sit well with me at, at all. Um, so when I finally got to this doctor, I was very open to her about my concerns and my desire to preserve fertility so that I'm not like having a situation where someone doesn't know that I want to have children and makes the decision for me to take my uterus out in the middle of a myomectomy. Moral of the story, if you're not feeling your doctor, change your doctor. You do not have to stay in a uncomfortable or not so great situation, especially with the amount of money you're about to pay this person to ensure that your health is preserved, or in my case, uh, save my uterus and make sure I can still have a kid. The second one was minimizing the risk of surgery on the table. Listening to doctors talk about um, the new research and new um, procedures, I'm excited about that. However, I definitely want something that's tried, tested, um, all you, you could do it blindfolded. So I wanted a surgeon that was experienced with uh, whatever the technique is that they're going to do and knows that if an emergency happens that they can handle an emergency. And what I was noticing with some of the processes like, oh, we don't have to go inside, it's minimally invasive. However, if something happens, we gotta cut you open. So I'm like, okay, how about I just go ahead and let somebody cut me open. You be thorough, open me up, touch the uterus, you know, touch everything and get all of the hard, um, dense, you know, tumors out of me, please. And, you know, to be a little graphic, but not too graphic, um, if you're queasy on medical stuff, I'm going to advise you to just close your eyes and listen to my voice. Do not look at the screen because I want to explain, you know, what they were able to take out. All right, now your eyes are closed. We went in looking for three sizable fibroids, the largest of which was supposed to be about seven centimeters, a little bit around that. These are all from the little, you know, black and white ultrasounds. That's what they could see then, three fibroids. My doctor went in and um, since it's an open myomectomy, we're talking like, you know, cesarean cut, open them up, you know, same way some of you guys are probably born, same way I was born, and um, pull the uterus out to do this. So what they were able to see in there was, um, not three, but a total of 11 fibroids. Now, Oscar was the largest tumor. You see this one over here. It was about 9.2 centimeters and measured out. And you see how that could easily be felt through the skin, through the muscle. That's, that was causing me a lot of problems. There was also another one. The second largest one was 7.7 .7 centimeters. And all of these guys here, you see, they were living rent-free inside of my uterus. Oscar and the gang had to go. I was so sick and tired of being in pain. And to see these suckers at the end of all this, I was like, thank you. All right, guys, safe to open your eyes up now. No more blood, guts, and gore. But I wanted to make sure that it's one thing to look at caricatures. It's another thing to look at this is pure heart. Like, this is flesh. This is what we were dealing with. And there are women who have had way more fibroids than me. I've seen ones that were the size of, you know, like a basketball. So imagine that. And honestly, um, think before you start asking women, like, why are you w gaining weight? Uh, you might want to ask them how they're just feeling because you never know. She could be carrying a tumor around. My final determining factor as to what type of treatment I was going to get comes down to the implicit bias surrounding black women when it comes to medicine. 
The history of gynecology alone shows that black women have been used for torturous research and it also influences how many doctors see us when they see us come into their offices and definitely when they see us on the surgical table. I wasn't ready to be anybody's cadaver or experimentation and I understand that we are long past um, the history of gynecology and how black women's bodies were used but I don't know sometimes. According to the CDC, black women are around three times more likely to die from a cause related to pregnancy in comparison to their white peers. Now you couple that with the racial climate that we're dealing with here in 2021, um, you know, we're a year past George Floyd, we're seeing people not see the humanity in black bodies. Something as delicate as your reproductive system and your ability to be a mother one day, I'm not gonna entrust it in everyone because I don't know what you're thinking when you go home. I don't know how you were raised and I don't even know how you interpret black women's um, pain thresholds or you know, once I cross 40, maybe that person might not even feel like I deserve to even be a mother anymore and might just say, oh, I made a mistake during surgery. Let me just take the whole thing out she can adopt. I want to make sure that whoever was working on me saw my humanity walking in the door because thanks to COVID, no one goes into the hospital with you. You're in there by yourself. And I did my best to make friends with everybody on the staff. I even took them candy, but that still doesn't guarantee me that when I'm unconscious, when I have no way of fighting for myself and there's no one in the, in the waiting room to kind of ensure that, hey docs, take care of this person, I had to be able to trust the people who are working on me. And um, speaking as a person who, have ha who has had multiple threats over the past couple years, um, thanks to the lovely internet, um, safety, was a big thing and recognize there is implicit bias. I just didn't want to take that chance. Picking your treatment should be a very personal, thoughtful decision. You want to circle a wagon of all the people who care about you and see what they possibly have t for input. But the only advice I can offer you as a stranger telling you her story is if you encounter a doctor and the only treatment option they offer you for fibroids is to get a hysterectomy, oh my God, run, like run for the hills. That is not the doctor for you. There's too many treatments out there for someone to be sterilizing you. You have options. So to summarize all of this, uh, remember you have options and you're not alone in this fibroid journey. There are many people out there to support you. And finally, you do not have to suffer in silence. I'm Nikki and that's my fibroid story.